Good evening, everybody. I'm sorry today I won't be able to join you. However, I hope this presentation will be useful for Paula to understand all the materials that preceded this project and uh, how she will be able to start working from them in order to achieve the greater outcomes of this uh, overarching project and also to understand what the expectations of this project are and hopefully to somehow identify a sort of timeline of tasks she will need to check out step by step in order to reach these final outcomes. So today I will be talking about four main points. What EU Star Gs was as a project and its characteristics by design and the contribution X23 paid to the project. Um, the problems that this project uh, presented and uh, how they were solved and which outcomes they finally yielded. Also we will be looking at some of the other projects or at least have an overview of how other projects will be integrated within this larger blueprint project. And finally, we will try to identify some sort of timeline of tasks that uh, Paula and everybody who will be working her, supporting her, I'm sorry, will need to work through in order to complete this job. So let's start by understanding what EU Star G's is and narrating what its story really was. So EU Star G stands for EU Startups for Refugees. The project ended fairly recently on the 14th of October 2020 and lasted 27 months. X23 coordinated the project in tandem with another Italian organization called ERIS. Besides them, however, there were other four participating organizations uh, that were part of an international consortium within this project. These were two Spanish organizations, Madrid-based IBC that mostly focused on communication and entrepreneurial strategy services, Barcelona-based Chapter 2, a business incubation for migrants and young entrepreneurs, a Finnish Helsinki-based startup refugees consisting of a very well-established network in Northern European countries, and finally Austrian OESB, a public organization that caters mostly for documentation and permission needs for migrants, refugees and asylum seekers. Now, there were some significant differences among the different participants to this consortium, some of which are very instrumental in highlighting some aspects that are very salient to this project's imp implementation. So, the first difference comes from Finnish startup refugees that appear to express a higher number of commercially successful startups from migrant participants. And this is mostly due to three reasons. First one being label qualification. Migrants who reach Northern European countries are on average more skilled than the ones who stop in other European regions who sometimes are not even interested into pursuing entrepreneurial projects. The second reason is political differences that make for a lack of legal infrastructures allowing migrants to smoothly pursue entrepreneurship. And a significant example of that in Italy are the lengthy time migrants need to wait before being even eligible to employment. And then the third reason is the lack of infrastructural resources at the physical level. Migrant and refugee centers often do not even offer private space, internet connection, and most of the resources needed for pursuing personal projects. So this is the first difference that really has to do with environmental reasons and the countries where migrants are hosted within the EU. Another kind of reason instead has to do with the individual approach each organization had within this specific consortium and comes from Austrian OESB. They proved not so adaptive to the migrants' needs as the project envisioned. So just to make an example, many migrants are not proficient in English as they access their host EU countries. By considering English fluency a necessary prerequisite for migrants to access the program, OESB excluded many possible valuable candidates, and acceptance standards extended as far as to mathematical skills. So OESB came to the point of sometimes even questioning the very project's viability, and had to learn some flexibility from Southern European partners. Now, these two differences we have explored are, in one occasion, an environmental difference, and in another occasion, an approach difference that comes directly from the organizers and promoters of this project. So when looking at the other projects within the blueprint general work uh, we will be working at, it should be important to perhaps focus and identify these reasons and phenomena that had an appreciable impact on the outcomes of the project. So the project is based on X23's participation into two other projects, Me for Change, that was uh, an 18-month-long project 
still related to providing migrant beneficiaries uh, with uh, some sort of integration and entrepreneurial occasions within the uh, European Union, and then Elimi, a similarly related project in which X23 played a prominent role in the dissemination and design phase, but did not hold a coordinating role, <coughs> as was the case in EU strategies and interchange. Now, what did EU strategies really consist of? So, it was initially designed only for young refugees that were divided into two categories on the basis of age. So, category number one being participants aged from 15 to 18, and category number two, uh, enlisting participants aged 19 to 24. Now, across these two categories, differentiated approach would be taken in order to provide training across different key areas. These areas being basic professional competences, local language learning, where necessary also English learning, basic legal and economic knowledge which is instrumental to rising entrepreneurs, and finally, two special concluding modules for the program's formation stage. These modules were a training and a mentorship. Now, what was the training? The training provides the basic knowledge necessary to found and lead a startup, which has the characteristics of an internationally oriented, fast-growing company. It possibly relies on tools such as e-commerce, and that is interested in attracting capital, capital sorry, from private investors, public and administrative entities, or credit organizations. The training also emphasizes the importance of these characteristics in the context of attracting capital investment. Then we had, finally, a mentorship, which was open to the most brilliant and, of course, available participants to the training. Mentees could cluster in work groups on the basis of common interests and shared projectual perspectives and, with the help of the mentoring organization, such as X23, look for launching investments. So X23 conducted both the training and the mentorships, so it could be interesting from the perspective of the researcher to look at the X23's approach specifically in order to have already some sort of standard information that then could be applied to understanding and analyzing the contribution from the other participants and also the other similar projects. Now, each mentorship culminates in a demo day in which occasions the participants present their entrepreneurial projects to a jury of investors. The demo day's purpose is to attract monetary or in-kind investments from these very members to the migrant participants. Whereas two demo days were held, and actually for one of them, one of the X23's mentees, a woman that actually can be seen very recently and very frequently in the office these days, uh, came second. Unfortunately, they did not result in appreciable monetary investment. Now, USRG is faced at a global level, um, so coming from all participants, three key problems that resulted in some outcomes and of course were met with some solutions. So these projects were, these problems, I'm sorry, uh, were the following. The first one has to do with the differences between refugees and migrants. So as they often lack documentation, refugees generally experience more legal barriers than other types of migrants in areas like employment or enterprise. Because differences between migrants and refugees are different themselves across European countries, each organization in the consortium had to face different sets of challenges and could afford different reaction times to emerging issues. Therefore, right before the practical implementation stage of the project, programs were open to economic migrants other types of migrants, and also age requirements were removed. Now, the second problem instead has to do with, of course, pandemic-related limitations. Across the project, enrollment of migrant participants was performed in tandem with local organizations that cater for housing, employment directioning, bureaucratic assistance, and other services to migrants. Unfortunately, however, such organizations experienced a dramatic downsizing in the wake of the pandemic. Many of the participants, therefore, experienced a reduction in mobility or needed to take on works that absorbed most of their time, decreasing their ability to commit. We seek the in-person support each organization could provide them during their training and mentorships. Some participants could not overcome language and technical barriers. And finally, health impairments sometimes struck with participants or their families, forcing them to leave the EU for their home countries some of them didn't have the chance to come back. And finally, the third problem that was faced within EU strategies were political issues. 
Political climate is very salient to migrant enterprises. And just to make an example that has to do with Italy, but is not of course country specific and applies to any participating country, not only within the EU, but really globally. Since the first time X23 has participated in projects with migrant beneficiaries, 2016, Italy's government has changed three times, resulting in sudden shifts across welcoming and rigid migrant policies. Many of the local governments and the local political climates are saturated with xenophobic attitudes. And this makes it very hard for the participants to diffuse their entrepreneurship projects in the local context. For example, municipal government groups often do not issue the necessary documentation and permits to the participants to, for example, obtain rent, which are the very basic uh, resources necessary for uh, developing an entrepreneurial perspective. Now, just to make a more structured example in this context, X23 activated a participation with an organization called Exodus. Every time a governmental group seizes power in administration, financial and infrastructural resources are jeopardized. And this brings about two fundamental problems that are really the key focus, really perhaps uh, the key area where these groupings need to yield results or at least uh, provide recommendations. The two fundamental problems are that projects are harder to implement and that project's impact is uncertain and generally weaker due to unstable political climate or contrary political climate. This introduces two very important biases in the very design and preliminary phases of the projects and it is especially salient to whoever is in charge of developing a general blueprint for this project to take care of finding perhaps better designs to augment the project's impact from the very design phase up to the end of the implementation phase. Now, the presented problems alter the project in three major ways. The first one is that they delayed the project's duration from 18 to 27 months. And second, they forced the consortium organizations to redesign many of their project's components with mixed results. For instance, the transition from in-person to hybrid training and mentorship sessions resulted into an 80 to 90% dropout rate for the supervision class in X23 at the time. Similar problems were, of course, met by companion organizations as well. However, as Marika mentioned yesterday, the overcoming of challenges sometimes resulted in improvements to the project's implementation itself. So it can be an interesting aspect to look at as well. Now, let's start talking about the blueprint. And first, let's see what the projects we will be looking at in order to build this comparative larger blueprint based on the smaller blueprints individual to each project look like. So you will synthesize and analyze 12 different projects. Among the 12 projects that you will work on, three, which just to remind, EU Star G's, Need for Change and Elin were heavily participated by X23, either in the designing, implementation or coordination. On such occasions, X23 interacted with about 15 different organizations. However, there are about 90 organizations that were involved in the totality of this project. That, as you can see, has a rather large scope. The projects can be subdivided into two categories, empowerment projects and network projects. Empowerment projects include nine of the ones you would study. They are the great majority. And empowerment projects attempt to offer an immediate and concretely appreciable impact for their beneficiaries. All of the three projects X23 participated into fall into this category. And the second category instead are network projects that, of course, you will be looking at with a bit more of an outsider perspective as X23 has not participated into any as, uh, as, uh, as for the time being. Uh, that include only three of the ones you will work on. They aim at developing the community infrastructure necessary for empowerment projects to be successful and significant. So they are actually a very important asset for the general projectuality the European Commission can put forward and finance. All the information about the projects that you will need is available from three main sources. The first being proposal and design documentations. The second being at interim reports. And finally, the final reports with all their deliverables. There will be some, of course, extra sources, but we will talk about them perhaps later, as they require some 
special production and effort on the researcher side. So almost all consortia provide all the documentation. Some are missing something. And extra Anglia has actually obtained more material than Scotland. Now, let's start understanding what a blueprint really is. A blueprint for EU Stargis has been designed already by the Extra Anglia team and is at the very last page of the blueprint book Carolina just showed you yesterday. So if you want some reference, you can check it out. However, there's no need for you to do something that is exactly identical to the work somebody else in the team has produced already. Uh, other of your colleagues, you might look at some works by Dana or Henry, have done already some preliminary work. However, you have the liberty to possibly even redesign completely your approach, as of course, that is a project of very long breath for you. So, the blueprint is initially meant to be a graphic representation of the instructions necessary to develop a system, especially in the architectural context. In fact, it's a word that comes from the very architecture semantic field. A service blueprint, for example, explains how a service should be provided optimally in the characteristics of the process. A blueprint can be applied on the logistics of any process, mechanic or commercial, and it can be applied to contexts as the storage uh, optimization just to make an example, uh, think about the blueprints necessary for providing um, warehouse services in uh, Amazon, warehouse, Amazon warehouses. Uh, I'm sorry. So these are very interesting, um, interesting pieces of design that you can find applied to many, many contexts of system thinking and organization. Blueprints like these apply differently, however, than in the case of mechanical or algorithmic processes as they really apply to processes that are not exact. So a single event cannot be exactly linked with another event and a branch of causing phenomena. So here is a very important point. This blueprint does not wish to give a prescription about how this project should be made because of their inexact nature. It is important to strike a balance between a normative and a narrative approach in developing all of these blueprints, especially the overarching one. It will be important to emphasize the importance and dynamics of empathy and altruism, phenomena like that which are very important in the context of migrants' assistance and entrepreneurship and that, however, are not, be ab are not really able to be synthesized in uh, mechanicistic processes and reasonings. So the narration of participant organizations and beneficiaries is a very important resource to this extent. However, not much narrative is available and I will just explain you why. There's a lot of documentation in the final reports that you will be able to analyze. However, there's not much space for narratives and really what has to do with the most um, organic aspects of these projects. This is mostly because EU evaluators generally do not have a high sensitivity to the organic nature of the projects. This does not allow an emphasis on the diversity of the projects, for example, and fundamentally results in a lack of three very important aspects, which are specificity, impact analysis, and critical analysis. So that is why we also need, besides this document, I just have introduced you to another form of uh, sources, especially for what has to do with the narrative. We need a survey that should be conducted to all participant organizations within the consortium and also when, uh, when we work with other projects. Some materials instrumental to this service have already been prepared by David, and you can work in tandem with him when it comes to developing this service. However, they are not completed yet, as uh, they do not include information from other projects besides the one extra and three participated. So, let's now talk briefly about a timeline of tasks that you could go through one by one in order to finally complete uh, this, this rather complex work. So the first step I would advise you uh, to pursue is reading EU Stargis. Some of the documents that have to do with it, especially perhaps uh, the proposal and designing documentation and perhaps the final report. You should also review the rest of the documentation that perhaps has to do with EU Stargis and the other documents. Obviously taking your time because that is the most massive aspect of your work. So just get a general idea. You could check implementation plans, especially in the B section of the final reports or the 
for, for the design report, the design documentation, I'm sorry, and also check some of the deliverables. Then you could look through the materials that were prepared for the service in tandem with Davide. And uh, based on what you have read already, uh, you could ask Davide to recontact the consortia and ask them the availability to open a new conversation with you in order to gain some information and all that narrative that is missing, along with all other information you would want to obtain. Now, you should then prepare these interviews and some recommendation would be to plan for some logistic contingencies. It's important to consider that it's about uh, summertime, full summertime, so some organizations might be unavailable. So I would recommend checking on those aspects and being very careful about the timing of this long-lasting project. Um, set up, of course, the interview length and framework, but then start practicing with the members of X23 who participated in EUSTAR-G's Me for Change and Evin. That is very important because, of course, you have a chance uh, to have already some sort of pilot test of your service, which you could really uh, practice a number of times with everybody within X23 who has some knowledge of of these projects before you put out this service to, to other project participants. Then, of course, you can conduct interviews and some things you could uh, look at um, besides what we have talked so far are considering some contingency managing management. I'm sorry, this is getting to the end of the presentation and my English is falling a bit short, but contingency management it is very important because it has to do with all the areas that are controversial and perhaps would be even problematic to report um, on a final report for EU commissioners. Just to make an example, uh, there are some cultural convictions or even beliefs, behaviors that shall not be reported, of course, on official documentation, but seem to be very salient to the migrants on one-to-one -one conversation. You could also even get to talk with some of the migrants that participated in order to receive some of these insights that nevertheless are very precious. And finally, develop the blueprint. And that's probably the bulk of the work, the final outcome. Um, you should be careful about the framework that was established once again. Take the liberty to create something original as long as it makes perfect sense. Uh, the recommended process timeline for the development of this blueprint would be to first make an integral individual analysis of each um, project you see, and then create a blueprint, of course, for each of the project, an individual blueprint. After that, you can make some sort of comparative analysis among the different pieces. However, it's important to know that this is not a sort of systematic review. It's not based on comparative analysis exclusively, so try to strike a balance between comparative and individual analysis. Then, you can make a result analysis of comparisons and consider the social impacts of each project, which uh, we believe could be one of your areas of expertise. And finally, you create the blueprint. Uh, and once again, do not put so much emphasis on prescriptions, rather identify the most important critical points salient to the project. Finally, some information about what this project will result into, as we have mentioned already yesterday, the final product will be probably the basis of a law proposals in the European Parliament. The blueprint will not run infinitely because, of course, these projects are in constant evolution, but uh, there is uh, the need to have some concrete outcome coming at a specific timing, uh, but it could be part of a rather uh, long-lasting organic project. That's all. This has been an incredibly long presentation but I hope uh, it can be useful to Paula and everybody who's uh, going to work on this project uh, to, uh, to get a good systematic start. I'm always available to answer any question. I'm, of course, not an expert in many of the fields, but I'm more than enthusiastic to provide help, support, participation, an opinion, if necessary, in any field. Um, you will find the recording of this presentation available for you every time you will need. And there's also a transcript that I will share with you. Thank you very much uh, to everybody that participated. I hope uh, you have a very productive and a wonderful rest of uh, this meeting. Goodbye.